When you found out that Jeffrey Epstein had, quote unquote, committed suicide in jail, there are all these conspiracy theories out there. I know, you know, and I don't need to tell you that, you know, he was involved with the super wealthy people, super powerful people. Do you think he committed suicide? Yes, I do. I, you know, as a prosecutor, I, I base my thinking and decisions on facts and evidence, not conspiracy theories, not conjecture. And for those who think, well, he had a list a mile long, he had secret videos. OK, well, where is it? And uh, I was told Ghislaine Maxwell had the same list and same videos. Where is it? Right. More recently, we have been covering, as you know, the Dan Markell murder case, and we are deep into it. And then we just started ca- uh, covering this case out of Toronto, Barry and Honey Sherman, a billionaire couple, the 12th richest guy in all of Canada, was murdered in the most odd of ways, strangled with a belt, him and his wife, and left hanging. Crazy. It's five years ago that they were murdered, still unsolved. We talked about, obviously, the difference with the Dan Markell case is we know who killed him, and now it's who will face justice. Today, I say this sometimes, but I definitely mean it this time, we have probably the best guest, along with Georgia Kappelman, that we could have on this. And Carm, for full disclosure, you said that the great Dave Arenberg, the state attorney from Palm Beach County, Florida, would not show for our measly podcast, and you were wrong. He is a mensch and a scholar. Dave, thank you for joining. Joel and Carm, the honor is mine. Thanks for having me. Are you surprised he's here in the flesh, Carm? Well, I, he's a man of his word, and uh, he, he didn't have a, quote, emergency that he couldn't come. Quick shameless plug. Follow us on YouTube. Drop your email in the comment section if you want us to send a newsletter. Follow us on Instagram, Facebook, and, of course, Patreon. Now, With let me tell the audience, yes, Carm. You should mention, since we have such an honorable guest, (laughs) that we we already have how many episodes? We are close to 90 episodes in. I'll tell you what um, my biggest, as a neurotic Jewish guy with OCD, and as a former reporter, they refer to him as the state attorney for Palm Beach County, Florida. But if you are saying his name another way, it'd be the state's attorney, comma, state, comma, S. And I don't know, it just drives me crazy. It always has. It makes no sense. But you must refer to people who are distinguished properly. He told me to call him Dave, which is, you guys hear me calling him Dave? It's because he said to call him Dave. So without further ado, let me tell the audience about the state attorney for Palm Beach County, Florida. Uh, He was a former member of the Florida Senate. He was elected to the Senate in 2002. By the way, he's two years younger than me and way more successful, but I'm not bitter. Uh, He was the youngest member of of the Florida State Senate, and I believe 31 years old. Am I right about that, Dave? At the time, yes, sir. Look at that. Accomplishing things at 31, Carm. Now, like his bright pal, Dan Markell, Dave also went to, not surprisingly, to Harvard undergrad and Harvard Law, just to rub it in. And Carm, this part is for you. Then Senator Bill Nelson and Dave Arenberg worked together to investigate European insurance companies that refused to honor World War II era policies sold to victims of the Holocaust, like yourself, Karen. Working with members of the National Association of Insurance Companies, the NAIC, the investigation led to the establishment of the International Commission on Holocaust Insurance Claims and the enactment of Florida's Holocaust Victims Assistance Act to ensure that insurance claims of Holocaust victims were expeditiously identified and properly paid, compensated, or returned. Carm, I know you wanted to bring this up before we get to Dan Markell. No, no, I didn't want you, to Would you like to fa- you, thank Dave No, no, personally. no, I wanted to say that he didn't do this uh, 8, 10, 12 hours a day. He did other good things. Uh, for example, am I correct that you, um, uh, you were- Carm, if you're going to show off, have it readily. No, I, wait a second. I have it readily available. 40% decrease between 2017 and 2018 in opioid death. He created the Sober Homes Task Force. I wonder why was it called the Sober Homes? That I couldn't understand. Why was it called Sober Homes Task Force? What does it mean, Sober Homes Task Force? Well, Carmela, my office created a task force to go after the fraud and abuse in the drug treatment industry. We were getting a lot of reports that the 
industry had been corrupted by bad players who were milking insurance and just keeping people in a cycle of relapse rather than recovery. And part of the problem was the uh, the corruption in the drug treatment and sober home industry. So you're correct that sober home task force is probably a misnomer because it's much broader than that. Sober homes got a lot of attention. That's the, the homes that people lived in. Uh, many of them were corrupted at the time. The problem was broader than just sober homes. It was sober homes, drug treatment centers that were all being investigated for their practices. And there were a lot of good players in the industry who helped us, but the bad ones gave the industry a bad name and led to deaths from the opioid epidemic. And so that we have really uh, made a difference there. We drove a lot of those bad players out. We put handcuffs on about 120 people, and we've largely cleaned up the industry here in Palm Beach County. And that is uh, Yeoman's work. And Carmela, it goes to show that you will derail our subject matter to prove that you did some work. So we're, yeah, I we're, like to we're show proud of you. The little work I do, I like to show. Dave, how did you get to know Dan? I was a state senator between 2002 and 2010, as you mentioned, and I spent a lot of time in Tallahassee. And I met Dan through friends. He was another, you know, Jewish guy who graduated from Harvard, and he was just in my circles up there. And and he was a great guy. Everyone who knew Dan liked him. He was just a wonderful guy. He was really smart, engaging, very interested in law and politics, which you know, those are two field, two of my favorite fields. And you know, we were friends and no one deserves what happened to him, but especially when, you know, it happens to such a shining star who really had no enemies other than, well, I guess people very close to him. Yeah. Those closest to you can be your biggest enemies. Uh, side note, how many, you guys met, I believe at the Harvard alumni club, which met, led me to wonder how many Harvard alums are there in Tallahassee? Is it a big club or like three people? It's a small club, and that's why uh, <laughs> we found each other pretty quickly. <laughs> Harvard doesn't guarantee you anything in life, but it does create a bond with, you know, in a city like Tallahassee when there's only a couple of alumni uh, there, and that's how we became friends. That obviously leads to the next question. Did you know Wendy as well? And if so, what was your impression of her, at least your initial impression? I, I knew Wendy not, not very well. Uh, she and I were Facebook friends, and... Um, I had met her briefly, and then I knew her afterwards when she was uh, working for someone in Miami. I haven't seen her since the murder of Dan Markell, but um, I have met her in the past, and I haven't uh, spoken to her in, uh, since shortly after uh, his murder. Yeah, they have one thing in common. Uh, they have more than one thing No, in wait common. a second. One thing that they have in common is that they're both from Miami. Here is somebody who didn't run away from New York. He was born here. The great Dave Arenberg is from Miami. Wendy, you're saying, is from Miami, but she's not really from Miami. She's from Parkland, but she lives here now. And now I happen to be in the same circles as some people that know her. And word on the street is she's not living a very comfortable life. She is looking over her shoulder uh, quite a bit. And we're going to get to that, uh, you know, the the hunt for justice uh, in, in a few. But... A little bit more about um, Dan was really devoted to his faith, to Judaism. What was he like in terms of, you know, his involvement in the Tallahassee Jewish community? Did people look up to him? He, he was pretty involved, correct? Yes, he was. And, you know, he had a lot of students look up to him because he was an excellent professor and he was very provocative with his writings. He challenged you. And that was one of the lines of inquiry after he was murdered, thinking maybe someone targeted him because of his writings. But uh, obviously, that's not the reason why he was murdered. But yeah, he was involved with the Jewish community. He was involved with the Harvard Club. He was just involved with um, just with the university and everything else in Tallahassee. As you say, Carm, he definitely had a joie de vivre, a, a joy for life. Now, we did a special show for his 50th birthday, which just passed. It's been over eight years, coming up on nine years since the crime. How are you personally feeling about um, the case now and uh these slow moving wheels of justice. I'm feeling a lot better about it. I, I want full justice for Dan Markell and his family. Like many people, I was waiting for the other shoe to drop after Catherine. Uh, Mo- I can't ever pronounce Mag- her last name. Magbanua. We can't either. Yeah, can't I don't either. love to mention defendants' names too much more than they, they deserve. But yes, because she was a big part in this murder. And she, you know, after the first trial, I was so disappointed that uh, there was apparently a holdout juror and it was a mistrial. I'm so 
glad the uh, they have a great lawyer prosecutor like Georgia up there. And they did it again. They got a conviction. But we all suspected there was more to it and was hoping that the roads would lead to Charlie. And it did. And they got that tape, that recording in the restaurant. They were able to enhance it. And that was the difference. And they were able to charge him. So kudos to the state attorney's office up there. You know, I know Jack Campbell. He's a good man. He's my counterpart up there in Tallahassee. And I know he just wants to do justice. And there's no politics involved here. There's no special treatment for anyone. It's just doing justice. And once you have enough evidence, you move. And he did. It's interesting you bring that up because there was uh, allegedly politics involved when Willie Meggs was there. Do you care to comment on that at all? It took a while. Do you, do you think that uh, that was a failure in the justice system? Frustrations of this job is that the wheels of justice can move slowly. You have to have a good faith basis. You can get a conviction beyond any reasonable doubt. And so you have people in the public who say, hey, there's probable cause. Make the arrest. Like for us as prosecutors to file charges, you have to have more than probable cause for us. We're different than the police. We file charges when there's a good faith basis that we think we can get a conviction beyond any reasonable doubt. And that can be frustrating for people. And what doubles the frustration is that we are forbidden from discussing these investigations that are pending. And so we say what we can, but the stuff that people want to hear, we're not allowed to discuss. And so you have a lot of frustration out there saying, hey, it's taken so long. And we say, yes, we agree, but we have to develop evidence. And then, well, explain to us what's going on. And we said, we can't. And so, yeah, I can see why people would get upset. And they get upset with us sometimes here in the 15th Judicial Circuit because of the slow moving wheels of justice. But it is our system. It's the one we're stuck with. And as Winston Churchill said about democracy, it's maybe the worst system in the world, except for every other system. <laughs> I heard this. It's, it's a good quote. So, Carm, did you have your hand raised? No, 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 no. I was just directing the orchestra. Oh, beautiful. So, Dave, what do you think uh, Dan's reaction to all of this would be? I mean, that's kind of an overarching question, but I mean, everything from who allegedly committed this crime, who's being tried for it, to this case being as high profile as it is when another Dateline episode is coming out. What do you think his reaction would be to all this? Well, you want justice. He's always been a big believer of justice. He also wants, you know, he's a believer that everyone is entitled to their constitutional rights. He would probably be approving of the fact that the state has made this a case where they have really, they meticulously been investigating and they have not jumped the gun to charge anyone who didn't deserve to be charged. And and I know, like, again, there are a lot of people who want the whole family charged. But until you get that evidence, if you charge first and ask questions later, you could lose the whole case because there's speed trial rules. And once you file those charges, the clock starts ticking. And if you don't have the goods, you're going to lose it all. And that's why you, prosecutors have to wait until they get enough to say we're going to go. And that's why they had to wait until that secret audio and video came out. They had to enhance it. They didn't have enough. Perhaps now Catherine will provide evidence uh, for the state against Charlie. You can make a deal after you're convicted. Obviously, she's not the most credible witness because she's lied already about this. But if she wants to give up the goods, well, I'm sure prosecutors will, would be interested in, in hearing it. And then we'll see what Charlie, uh, what kind of defense he puts on the stand. That's going to be must-see TV. I, I can't wait for that trial. In addition to your good looks, with which Carmela uh, had, talked commented, this, had on. commented on, um, she's also very impressed with the size of the office. How many people is he in charge 120 of? 120 attorneys and 240 uh, staff that are uh, uh, non, non-attorneys but related to the... That's 240 more than me. That's yes. 200... No, no, it's 360 uh, more. 360 than. more. And, and the point is Dave is in charge of a lot of people. And Dave, you every day people are presenting evidence to you uh, to prosecute, right? So is there any kind of sweet spot? Because you, you just said, and you alluded to the fact that the wheels of justice sometimes move slowly. We have a, a pretty rabid following for this podcast. Thank you, everyone, everyone for tuning in. Um, look, they want Donna indicted. They want Harvey indicted. They want Wendy indicted. I mean, is there a way to say that this has taken too long or not taken long enough? Is there an average amount of time? Is there a sweet spot or every single case is individually based? Every case is different. We're trying a case here in Palm Beach County where the murder took place in 1990. We talk about a cold case, talk about a delay, and the arrest was finally made in 2017. And 
the defendant's still in jail and hasn't gone to trial yet. And it's going to be 2023 coming up. So yeah, these things can move slowly. And then there's other cases we're able to go pretty quickly, but it, every case is different. And you know, the more high profile the case, generally the slower it will go. You have more eyes on it, more lawyers and more investigators dissecting every decision you make. And you better make sure your eyes are dotted and your T's are crossed. So if you start charging you know, the mother in this case, well, what evidence do you have that you could present to a jury that she committed a crime beyond any reasonable doubt? You know, it's it's one thing to say, here's the evidence. But then remember, she gets to put on a defense. She gets to cross-examine witnesses. And all it takes is one juror, as we learned in the Catherine case, one juror to have a little reasonable doubt. And it's a hung jury. You got to do it over again. And if you have 12 jurors or depending on the charge, it could be six jurors uh, who have doubt, then the person goes free. That's just the system we have here. The basis of our criminal justice system is that we'd rather have 10 guilty people go free than to allow one innocent person to be convicted. And when you have a system that's based on that philosophy, you get delays. How how difficult is it to prosecute a case and also separate the emotion? Well, if you know someone personally, it's very tough. And then you there are, there's a potential of recusing yourself, um, depending on how well you know the person. Uh, Jack Campbell, I don't believe, knew uh, Dan Markell. And uh, he is done his job dispassionately and with the right focus based on the evidence. And you don't want to cloud your judgment based on your based on personalities. You want to just follow the evidence and follow the law. And I think Jack is doing that up there in Tallahassee. And obviously there would be a conflict of interest with you handling the Dan Markell case because you knew him and you were friends with him. In a case like that, we hear Georgia Kaplan. I'm going to get to her in a minute. And she actually was kind enough and sweet enough to come on our podcast which actually made news in the courtroom, how involved in a high profile case like this would you be or are you? Well, I'm not involved at all. It's not my jurisdiction. No, no. I mean, I mean, in Palm Beach, if, if there's a very high profile case in your county, how involved are you? Well, it depends on the case. You know, ultimately, the, the final decisions are mine, but I do defer to the prosecutor. So if I was George's boss, she would be making the decisions. She'd come to me for advice or final uh, decision making on, on the big, important decisions. But most decisions we made by by her, and and that's the way I would, I deal with it here in this office. Most of the decisions are made by the people on the ground, and then if there's some big decisions, then then it gets cleared through me. But ultimately, my name is on the line, so whatever they do reflects you, and the buck stops here. You've got to take responsibility and ownership of the decisions made by the people who work for you. And because of uh, the fact that you are the Palm Beach County State Attorney. I'm going to put you on the spot here, and then you're probably going to say, I can't answer this, but maybe you can. I don't know. Do you believe that there is a preponderance of evidence against Charlie Adelson, who's set to go on trial for the murder of Dan Markell sometime in early spring 2023? I agree with the state attorney in Tallahassee, Jack Campbell, that there's a good faith basis to believe that they can get a conviction beyond any reasonable doubt. And beyond any reasonable doubt is above a preponderance of the evidence. Carm, I want to point something out. I could never be a state attorney because I am way too volatile, too emotional. You see how Dave handles this? Very level. We were just talking. I, I watch my competitor, Joe Rogan. I listen. People get some. He pe- has a fantasy that uh, Joe Rogan. My competitor, competitor, Joe Rogan. But Joe Rogan said something interesting today. He said, in life, you've got to be even keeled, which I'm not. But you've got to be very steady in life because you don't. Mainly, he said, because when people are too manic one way or the other, uh, Carm, you're a good example of that. One day I call you and you're sweet as can be. The next you're cursing me out. But, but where do you think you uh, got it from? Got it. I got it from you. But you can tell that Mr. Arenberg was raised uh, in a different sort of way where he is very level headed and calm, which is why he has his position. No, but he's also a leader. He's also very intelligent. No, obviously. a leader, a leader. It's not only intelligence. It's leadership. Steve, Dave, since we are talking about you, you care to comment? Well, Adol and Carm, I think either of you would be the same way in this job. The job has a way of leveling your emotions because you see a lot of horrible things every day you're able to compartmentalize it and do the job that people voted you to do and so i suspect you would do the same thing as state attorney by the way i don't want to embarrass him any further but i will he will probably be the governor of this great state god day. willing so be, and will he remember us will he remember us he'll hire me as his press secretary <laughs> it may be it may be tough we will work for you we will work for you 
I have a D after my name. And so that, that's tough in, in this reddish uh, in, in getting more red state. <laughs> no. We'll, we'll, we'll ship them up to New Jersey where we're from. So, Dave, we had a few weeks back. We had some, it was an interesting show. We had three ex cons on who served something like 90 years uh, combined cumulatively between the three of them for some pretty awful crimes. So they came on the show. Like murder. Murder. Um, got off on a technicality. Um, but they've repented and what, you know, they served some time. Anyway, they had a really interesting tape. We asked them if they thought, will Charlie flip? And at least two of them said yes, because they said that they, meaning the ex-cons, come from the street and there's a street code. And you're raised a certain way. One comes from the Detroit Mafia. He said he'd rather you know have his eyes gouged out than ever rat or flip. But they think that jail and ultimately prison is going to be too much for Charlie to stomach. And they think that he's going to cooperate. Do you foresee that at all? It's easier to think a defendant's going to cooperate when the others are not his family. So put it another way, people do flip when they are faced with years of incarceration, but it's a much tougher decision when the people they're flipping against are members of their own blood. Two things that really prevent these defendants from flipping. One is fear. You see that fear of retaliation in prison, fear of losing your income. You see that with Alan Weisselberg, for example, his income comes from Donald Trump up in New York. And so he's not flipping against him. That's who butters his bread up there. But another way is to go against the family, you know, to go against your own mother, your own okay. family. Yeah. I mean, that's that's a tough ass. So I don't know. That's a, that is interesting. But you know, it's always a possibility uh, because for a lot of defendants, these things don't become real until they start envisioning themselves in a orange jumpsuit. And that becomes realistic the closer you get to trial. And what does that do to a person's psyche? I mean, you've visited these guys in jail and in prison, um, trials coming, and now the realization that they could be in there for a lifetime. What does that do to a man or a woman? Well, I don't I don't visit defendants in prison or in jail. That's not, one of the good things about, be, about being state attorney and not public defender. Maybe the defense <laughs> lawyers do that, but not us. We're not visiting these guys in jail or, or prison. Fortunately, we get to go home. You see deathbed confessions at the, at the end of people's lives. You also see, you know, uh, people find religion right when they're about to see uh, themselves incarcerated for the next 30 years. So those are life changing moments. And all of a sudden, you know, the truth will set you free or at least get some years chopped off your sentence. I'm going to digress for one second and everyone's going to yell at me. And Carm said, don't dare ask him. But how has life been for you since uh, the former president is now a permanent resident of your county? Has it gotten a little more interesting? You know, the traffic is, is better um, now that he's not president because the area around Mar-a-Lago, which is pretty much you know, the heart of this uh, outside the downtown area. But it was a nightmare of traffic every time he wanted to go to the airport. Uh, Palm, West Palm Beach is one of the few downtown airports. You have an airport right in the heart of the city and you couldn't get anywhere when he was leaving town. But now that he's a former president, uh, traffic's much better. So in that sense, it's a plus. It seems like he's definitely not going to answer this, but it seems like there are too many civil and criminal investigations to count against the former president. Is he eventually going to get caught in one of these? Do you think Are you able to? Oh, I'll answer that. You know, I talk about these things on uh, on some of your competitors. Is he going to be in an orange jumpsuit one day? Oh, I don't know about that, but I do believe it's more likely than not that he'll be indicted sometime after the midterm elections for the Mar-a-Lago documents matter. I think that's the greatest threat to the former president. As far as other threats, I think uh, Georgia posed a real threat to him at the state level and uh, the January 6th investigation as well. But I would put it as number one being Mar-a-Lago, number two being Georgia, number three being January 6th. Uh, the civil lawsuit against him in New York by Attorney General Letitia James, that's serious too. But there's no risk of incarceration there in New York because that's a civil lawsuit. Now, Charlie yeah. Adelson was indicted. We'll get back to you, you know, and he's handcuffed if if he's indicted for these Mar-a-Lago documents. And we are getting back to Denmark in a moment. But if the former president is indicted. Would we ever see a scene play out on CNN or Fox News or MSNBC where the president, the former president, is handcuffed and taken away? Would that happen? 
I don't know. We're in uncharted territory. We've never had a situation where a former president is being investigated for potential criminal charges. We've never had a situation where a former president has been arrested, indicted, or put on trial. So, you know, anything could happen. But keep in mind this. When the feds executed a search warrant at the former president's home, they did not let anyone know. They did not let uh, pro- public know, the press know. They didn't have guns ablazing. They weren't in uniform. They did in a very low key way, getting walked through the property with the Secret Service. So if you're asking, will he be treated like every other defendant or in jumpsuit handcuffs? Uh, I don't know. But uh, the, the question I have, the... Carm, you can't believe he answered this and you can't believe I asked it. I can see it in your face. Yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm very happy that he came on our show. Since we are not competing with uh, CBS. Dave, a couple or, of weeks ago, she nodded off. It's definitely not happening today. I had a poker. But one you're, you're, time <laughs> I nodded off, I have to confess. She's 83. She I'm worked eight, out that I morning. I had my 83rd birthday. I nodded off for one second and he poked I me. poked her and she literally had an impulse reaction and started asking a great question. <laughs> so it wasn't that bad. But Carmen, no, continue No, but my on. question, now, the other thing I do, I have senior moments. I don't remember what, but I remember this time. Um, if this thing happened in, it, it did happen in Mar-a-Lago, will the, would the, your office be involved with it? Or is this a federal case that would be coming out of Washington? All the stuff is federal. The only way our office would be involved is if the former president committed a state crime here in Palm Beach County. The investigations of him are all federal um, involving Mar-a-Lago. There's a couple state investigations, one in Georgia that could result in criminal charges in Fulton County, Georgia. And then there's the civil trial against him in Manhattan that's being run by the Attorney General of New York, Letitia James. But anything to do with Mar-a-Lago and his conduct in Palm Beach County, that would be an investigation and potential prosecution from the feds. Now I'm going to push my luck here. In a big Joel, way, Joel, in a big way, and Joel, I'm derailing. Joel. But we had a gentleman on named William Steele, who claims to have known Jelaine Maxwell in a biblical sense and had met and dealt with Jeffrey Epstein. When you found out that Jeffrey Epstein had, quote unquote, committed suicide in jail, what was your reaction to that? I was uh, really disappointed that his victims wouldn't get justice, full justice. They're going to get a measure of justice with Ghislaine and uh, on the civil side. But as far as they're never going to see Jeffrey Epstein go on trial. And that was really disappointing. I was disappointed that they couldn't keep him alive after he had already attempted suicide once. There are all these conspiracy theories out there. I know, you know, and I don't need to tell you that, you know, he was involved with the super wealthy people, super powerful people. Do you think he committed suicide? Yes, I do. I, you know, as a prosecutor, I, I base my thinking and decisions on facts and evidence, not conspiracy theories not conjecture. And for those who think, well, he had a list a mile long, he had secret videos. Okay, well, where is it? And uh, I was told Ghislaine Maxwell had the same list and same videos. Where is it, right? And and there's no proof that there was anyone else involved with his death. I mean, he actually tried to commit suicide previously, just a few weeks before. So he committed suicide. Uh, and, and well, why were the police, uh, the guards asleep? Because it's an overcrowded prison. That's where the guards are understaffed, underpaid, and not thrilled with their jobs. And so, yeah, it happens. It's it's awful that it happened. But sometimes the correct explanation is the most obvious explanation. He committed suicide. Carm, you don't ask, they don't tell. So we had to ask, and I'm glad Dave is a uh, now trooper and answer. Now, now we're switching back to Markel here. This is what everyone's here for. So Georgia Kappelman, she came on our podcast. First of all, how well do you know her and what do you think of her as a her abilities as a prosecutor? Well, I, I, I know of her and I think I, I may have met her in the past, um, but I think very highly of her. She is well regarded around the state. A lot of us know her and have a lot of respect for her. Now, on our podcast, um, she actually broke some news saying that the state would not seek the death penalty against Charlie Adelson. We all know that Dan was a big he was a proponent uh, against the death penalty. He, did, he was opposed. That's the word I was looking for, opposed to the death penalty. Uh, does it surprise you, though, that the state would not seek the death penalty uh, with regards to Charlie Adelson? No, no, no. I, I First, yeah, you have the victim's family and the victim who would not have wanted the death penalty. And number two, you're dealing with someone who didn't pull the trigger and someone who allegedly 
set it up and paid for it. In general, you don't seek the death penalty for someone who wasn't the person who actually pulled the trigger. Luis Rivera, as you know, he he was one of the he's a Miami, the Latin Kings member, uh, one of the hired guns, uh, as they say. Was his plea deal a necessary evil um, from a prosecutorial standpoint? I mean, how how do you handle that when you know you can get a guy to talk, but you kind of have to give up, you know, some of the uh, justice that you're seeking? Oh, you have to. You have to sometimes cut deals. You have to hold hands with the devil sometimes because it's a bigger devil uh, who will go unpunished if you don't. And so, yeah, yeah, you got to do it. It's just a part of the prosecution. You know, he was in prison already. And so they extended his sentence um, and he provided important evidence that got the actual person who killed Danny Markell. Remember, the person who cut the deal was not the one who pulled the trigger and murdered Danny Markell. So, yeah, they were both culpable. But one was more culpable than the other. And the person who was most culpable was the one who is convicted and is going to be in prison for life. We had the great John Singer on. I don't know if you know him, uh, Dave, but he is a uh, very well-respected attorney out of New York, a Wall Street lawyer who's on CNBC. And I always joke with him that his billable hours are way too high for me to afford. So I know your time is even more valuable. So we're going to – I have a few more questions, but I know that your time is is valuable and we're going to – get to the uh, finish line sooner than later. But in this case, um, at the Arthur hearing, it was basically announced, the court announced uh, that there's something like 57,000 documents and 6,000 surveillance videos uh, that have been entered into evidence in this case. How um, daunting is that, or is that kind of par for the course in some ways? Well, that's news to me. I didn't know that was uh, the fact that there were so many documents, so many videos, but uh, investigators, you know, for a high profile murder case. Yeah. I mean, this happens and they're going to go through everything. You you can't leave any stone unturned because the other side is going to use it if you don't, uh, if you're not aware of it. Uh, but discovery can be very voluminous and I'm not that surprised, but that's the first I've heard of the exact numbers. It's crazy. I mean, it just seems like as a prosecutor or a defense attorney, I mean, you could literally be working on this 27 hours a day. Like it's never ending. So it seems, um, I don't know. Well, the paralegals can do it, like it, 10 paralegals. It seems daunting. That's right. Daunt. You, you get help. You get you people around you to help you with it. Absolutely. Mother can, knows best. Can I best. just tell you something? Yes, can I on. open a huge parenthesis? Yes. In the very beginning when we started our podcast, I said to Joel, Joel, we are always asking people to uh, to give us an hour here, to give, give us our, their opinions. I said... We should really get into the habit of asking them, what can we do for them? And I was just thinking, it it, it, it struck me as humorous <laughs> <laughs> to ask you, of all, you know, because we do this like routinely now. So Dave, what can Carmen and I do for you, she's asking. Well, I would love to be in your pot. Oh, you already did it. So there it is. <laughs> <All right. laughs> We can help uh, when he runs for yeah, governor. We will we'll camp. We will, we will campaign for him. Um, you, um, can, uh, you can you can ask your uh, listeners to follow me on Twitter while Twitter is still. Is it, are you paying? Are you paying eight bucks for the check mark, Dave? Not yet, uh, but I do a check mark. <laughs> we'll have to see. I, I I like the Twitter platform as as long as it doesn't become a cesspool of hate and anti semitism and racism. I, I'll uh, I'll stay. And uh, whether I'll pay dollars a month, we'll see. We just have to keep Kanye. We have to keep Kanye off it and Kyrie Irving. It makes me sick to my stomach to see that you can be so open about anti-Semitism these days without you know really any any second guessing or remorse. I mean, Kyrie Irving has had no no repercussion. Kanye West still has more followers. Carm, do you know who Kyrie is? No, he's a basketball player. Plays for the Brooklyn Nets. Okay, but- no Jews in Brooklyn, by the way. He's an anti-Semite in Brooklyn. Um, I uh, I would love your followers or your listeners to follow me on Twitter at Aaronberg, A-R-O-N-B-E-R-G. That's it. Just at Aaronberg. You hear that, everybody? You lots better be first, following at Aaronberg, at That's Aaronberg it. on Twitter. Yeah. Okay. So at the Arthur hearing, uh, Dave, Georgia pulled out this uh, what's now known as the Mitsuri tape. You were talking about the Dolce Vita tape uh, where they had to uh, enhance the audio. How many surprises could the state have up its sleeve here? And and how do you know how to use what you have, if you will? 
Well, the Saints can be limited to surprises because they've got to produce everything they have to the defense. And when that gets produced, it then becomes public. And so there won't be the surprises will be well before trial. So if you hear see any surprises, it's not going to be that Perry Mason moment where it's aha, we're just found this out at trial. We're not allowed to have surprises on our side. I think uh the, just anything you find out we'll know we'll know soon. When when is uh Charlie, when is the trial scheduled for now? I want to say March, February or March of 2023. However, many people say it'll be pushed back because of the amount of discovery. We got involved with it also, uh, you know, mano a mano, grandmother to grandmother. We got to know Ruth, Dan's mother, who is a wonderful person. And she was on our show and we felt uh, that we wanted to help her and get the justice for Dan. Carm, I get my uh, anxiety and high stress from you, and Dan got his intelligence from his mother. The yeah. apple does not fall yeah, far from the proverbial tree. You can only give what you have. What, were your, either your parents uh, attorneys, Dave? No, no, uh, neither is an attorney. And my grandfather was. Uh, I had a grandfather who was an attorney. But uh, and neither is in, was in politics. But my grandfather, a different grandfather, after whom I'm named, was in politics. And so that skipped a generation. I'm going to say that Dave's dad is a neurologist. That's my guess, no, but I'll leave it at that. I would say he's a biz- businessman. We'll, we'll, we'll leave it at that. <laughs> we can just play. play. It's play. closer to Carm than to you, Joel. Yeah. Dad, right. uh, dad is a retired uh, stockbroker investment advisor. Oh, there you go. Nice. So speaking of, uh, Mr. Arenberg's Twitter, at Arenberg, which you all better follow and follow me while you're at it. We're at STS Podcast, Podcast STS. I have to figure it out. I don't even know. Follow me, Joel Waldman News. Uh, Back on May 28th, 2022, the great Dave Arenberg tweeted, post-verdict pleas can happen in state court, although usually after sentencing. But when defendants lie on the stand, it's less likely they'll be used as witnesses in a later trial depends on how much evidence the state already has against the next defendant. He tweeted this, I believe, in reaction to the Magbanua verdict. Um, Is it too late, Dave, for cooperation from either Sigfredo Garcia, who's serving a life sentence for the killing of Dan Markell, or Katie Magbanua, same deal, who was sort of the intermediary? Depends on what they have. They're both tarnished. One's a murderer. The other one is a liar. And they're both involved, obviously, with the murder. Their testimony will be discredited by the defense lawyers. Now, if they've got a smoking gun I and mean, if they've got something like here's a secret recording of Charlie and his mother talking about the plot to kill Dan Markell. All right. Well, then the state will cut them some deal. But if it's just that, yeah, I heard something that I never mentioned before but I'm going to give it to you now because I want a deal after I've already been convicted and proven as a liar. Doesn't sound like a great bit of evidence, but it depends on what it is. Uh, So there's like an inverse relationship between the power of the evidence and the extent of the liar. If she has um, a lot of evidence, yeah, they're more likely to use it, but the less evidence she has, the less relevant it will be, the less likely she'll be used on the stand because she is a liar. But if she did have a smoking gun, let's say she this is all hypothetical. I underscore hypothetical. Let's say she came with one of your examples and said, here's a videotape of Charlie and Donna explicitly discussing the murder. What kind of leeway do you have as uh, the state's attorney out of out of Tallahassee? To, I mean, can you just cut her loose at that point? You have to keep her incarcerated for a certain amount of time. How does all that work? Well, first off, as you said at the beginning, it's state attorney, not state's attorney. And it's a, no apostrophe, no S, just state attorney. <laughs> and as far as they're not cutting her loose, no one, no one's cutting her or the murderer loose. Uh, but they would uh, possibly give give her some time off of the sentence if she had something that was a smoking gun. But she's got so little credibility that it better be documented. There better be co- corroboration. No one is going to give her a deal based on what she says now that contradicts everything she's said before. Because jurors won't buy it. And she didn't budge before either case, which has been a a point of a lot of speculation. Speaking of conspiracy theories, people believe that maybe the Adelsons are bankrolling uh, her children's childhood, paying for schools. And that's why she didn't speak up or didn't say anything 
uh, against anybody. I actually spoke to an attorney close to the case who says there's no way that is true. Any speculation on this and why she was mum the whole time? Well, as I said earlier, two reasons why you don't flip is one, you're scared. And the other one, you're dependent on an individual for uh, financial support, or it's a member of your family. That's another reason. But everyone is different. Some people just have a different code and they live by that code. You know, if you're in the mafia, the worst thing you can be is a rat. And of course, there's an element of fear if you do rat, but uh, everyone is different. You just don't know. But yeah, she was consistent in her too, but she's, she's a liar. And that makes her a difficult witness to serve as a key witness for the state. And so if she has anything that would benefit the prosecution, it's going to have to be corroborated by some third party source or some recording or something because her testimony is not going to do it. So Dave, how does this, uh, in your, in your mind's eye, how does this all wind up? How does this all play out in the end? Well, I'm hoping for justice in the case involving Charlie and then I think that's the big wild card. What happens next? Look, if Charlie is acquitted, then I think it's game over. Um, if he is convicted, then there's a lot more that can happen. So the stakes are really high in the uh, upcoming trial of Charlie. It should be fascinating to watch. And you know, we'll see what new evidence. Even though uh, everything has to be produced in advance, you've got to have discovery. Uh, there always are still some trial surprises that come out when the individuals take the stand. I guess... Maybe one big question is whether Charlie will take the stand in his defense. He's the, he's the maestro. He's a narcissist. What's your gut instinct? Generally, narcissists want to take the stand. They think they can talk their way out of anything. As a prosecutor, would you eviscerate this guy on the stand? Would you, it's, would every that be like your... it's every prosecutor's dream to get a, yeah. a, a narcissistic defendant on the stand to cross-examine him. It, ne- it rarely goes well for the defendant. And so we'll see. We'll see what happens. I can see Dave salivating. He's loving that. Get get Charlie on the stand and just hang him on that stand. Um, Carm, you've been uh, silent the last couple yeah, of minutes. Yeah, because I think uh, I think we've covered everything, you, and you don't want to let go now. I love Dave. He actually, you know, know. when you when you meet high profile people that you see on TV, uh, not you know, and then they're nice guys. You always appreciate that because I worked with a lot of high profile people on TV that were not nice guys. Bill O'Reilly. <laughs> to name to name one of many. One last thing, uh, Dave. Carm calls me last night and goes, Joel, you will never believe this. Dave Adenberg works on Christmas. I said, why shouldn't he? He's Jewish. What, what's the deal with that, Carm? Well, the, he found out that he, he, he performs a good act and the ones who celebrate Christmas can take off because he works. Dave, you're That's a, a very noble thing to do. My son-in-law, the doctor, does the same thing. By the way, on Dave's Twitter, and I know you're all going to follow, it, at the end it says he's one of, he has one of the best cookie jars on cable, Carm, by a place called Room Raider. Do you know what this is, Carm? No. Room Raider rates pundits and uh, experts like Dave who go on TV, on cable news, on yeah, CNN, yeah. MSNBC, Fox News, and when they're doing their interview like this, they rate the background. That's why I'm very particular about our background. And there's a, a Twitter profile, I think, called Room Raider. Oh, and Room they, Raider. I thought it's they Ruminator. Ra- no, no, Room Raiding the Room. And they said that Dave has one of the best cookie jars on cable, but not here. Not in this shot. I'm going to show you. Do you see it now? Oh, there it is. What? It's hard to make out from here, though. What is it? Is it a dog? It's a uh, Basset Hound cookie jar. Uh, my uh, beloved Basset Hound, who I just... Sadly lost uh, a couple months ago. Um, oh, yeah, don't mention I know. it. Oh, no, don't mention. Because Dave, my Mabel, my Mabel Rose turned 17 in January. I thought I was going to have to put her down, and now she's on blood pressure medication, kidney medication. I have to give her an IV every day, but I had her before my wife and three kids, and uh, she's one of the closest things. So I agonize over hearing that. I'm sorry. And I never... Uh, what a blessing. Uh, 17 years old. What a blessing. Yeah, yeah. Dave, listen... It was amazing having you on. You have an open invitation to the uh, to Carmela's building for lunch when you're back home in Miami. Um, we we have a little cafe. Thank little you, cafe. thank you, Carm. Thank you both. Thanks so much, being so on. much. Dave, by the way, before I let you go, very last thing. You do TV all the time. You're on all these boring what networks, the CNNs of the world. What do you think of Carmen and our show? I think you've got a great show, and I think that uh, the future is 
probably not in linear TV, but in podcasts and streaming. So you're on the right track. My only problem is she's 83. So. He, he tells me, don't dare to die. Yeah, yeah. We had a we had a comic on. He said, you're going to have to brand differently. He said, you're going to the show will be called I Survived the Survivor and all I got was this lousy podcast, but we're not thinking about that yet. No. Anyway, <laughs> we are living for the moment and this was a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful moment. Yeah. Triple wonderful. Dave, thank you so much. Thanks. Thanks thank a lot. We'll, we'll, we'll reach out again. Thanks so much. Very gracious of you. Thanks Love you, America. A lot. Thank you.